Hey, this is Rustin with Who Are Radio, and finally on the line with me, I have <laughs> the legendary Meatloaf. Thank you for joining us in the trip. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. The, you've got the new album coming out, Hang Cool Teddy Bear. I'd love to talk about that a little bit today. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good thing to talk about. <laughs> I think I was like three when you first broke into the business, opening up for Van Morrison and them. And, and then no, you, I was about four myself, I yeah, think. You <laughs> and you had Stoney and Meatloaf in 71, and of course Rocky Horror came out in 75. And, and don't had, forget I was doing Shakespeare in the Park in 72. Absolutely. And of <laughs> course in uh, 77, the monster success of Bad Out of Hell. Does it seem like 43 years now? No. Uh, no, I mean it... When, when I shot the Rocky Horror, the, the movie in 1974, and that, uh, I mean, you you create a, a lot of times when you do a movie, you create a real bond with people. And and I have a real bond with Barry Boswick and with Susan and with Richard O'Brien and, and with those people that will never go away, even though, you know, we don't see each other for lunch for, you know, 25 years, but, but it, it just doesn't go away. And Tim Curry, and, and you know, I, every four, five, six years, I see one of them. We talk for a while, and there's a real bond with that movie because uh, it was a uh, for a lot of us the first movie we'd ever done, and it was um, and there was a real bond. So that was a that was a real great piece of uh, uh, trivia, and it just doesn't seem that long ago. That of the hell definitely doesn't seem that long ago. Um, that was sort of like having uh, being in a knife throwing act, though doing bad out of hell, and and hoping the guy didn't miss, because <laughs> uh, it was it was a it, that was a tough you know I had to lie to get us to uh, I told him oh yeah I've got the money to record and we were in the studio for six weeks where they figured out we didn't have any money, uh, so that was it was pretty interesting time. A lot of people don't know this. A little bit of trivia for you, Meatloaf fans, who, who may not have the depth of knowledge that <laughs> some of us freaks do. But you actually replaced Derek St. Holmes as vocalist on Ted Nugent's Free for All album in '76. How? Yeah, happen? I did about eighty. I did about eighty percent of that record. Derek, I think, had done one track, and I didn't do that. I don't remember that. And I think Ted did one track, and I think I did the rest of them. And uh, I, I think. Ted did, Ted did Free For All, and Derek St. Holmes, I don't remember the song he did, but the rest of them on down, I sang the rest of the record, and, and we did it in like a minute and a half, and I had to throw the producers out of the studio, because when they, what, when they asked me to do it, all they sent me was the lyrics and the music. They, there was no, they didn't tell me anything. Uh, it's like the title, they told me the title of the song, on the lyrics, so I knew which lyrics went with which song, but there was no melody. There was no knowing when the when it came in, what the melody was, where the chorus was, what the and there was nothing. And so when we got down to Atlanta, the two producers, I would start singing something, and they start arguing with themselves. And I eventually said to them, "Why don't you guys leave and come back tomorrow?" And they did. <laughs> and, and I worked with the drummer. And that's basically, and then Ted came in, and we fixed a few more things, and we did it in about three days. Now I know why the album's called Free For All. Yeah. I think you got, what, about $1,000 for doing that? I did, but you know what? It was it was like receiving a check for $10 bucks at that point in my life. Okay. So I, I've never had, you know, it's not like I, I go, you know, some people hold these grudges, and they go, Oh, I did that work, and he got all that money, and I should be owed this, and and I, I just don't have that, you know. Great for Ted, you know, and he paid me, and it was, it was like a a blessing. I mean, my rent wasn't very much, and I think at that time, because I was working with Jim, we were on unemployment, and so that was like, wow, we were rich. Well, let's talk about the new album because that's what we're really here for today. Um, Unlike previous Meatloaf albums, which sort of have a dark and brooding overtone to them, a lot of that. Well, Bad of the Hell, Bad of the Hell kind of has that, but it's really, I guess, the dark and brooding thing is the the poor guy can't get laid. He's got teenage, you know. Every time he turns around, this, you know, stop right there or don't be sad or or uh, he, he's got a Saturday night and he's got no place to go and. And the girl stops him and says, wait a second, you took the words right out of my mouth, or the girl won't go with him on the motorcycle, and he's 
He says, I'm going to die if you don't go with me. So, yeah, I mean, he's having a tough time. <laughs> he just can't win. Well, on the and, flip side, Hank Will Teddy Bear has a very positive vibe. It does have a really positive vibe. And it is a, it is a, a story. It's based on a short story uh, by Killian Kerwin. And it is about a soldier who has been wounded in battle. It's a nonspecific battle. Uh, not specific war, and and his best friend is laying next to him, and uh, they um, his life flashes forward. It's like he thinks he's about to die instead of flashing backwards. It flashes forward into the possibilities of what his future might hold for him. And he's a bit of an outlaw. He's a bit of a uh, it, 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 not really a scoundrel, but he, he fancies himself as like a an outlaw, and he and he's from a really uh, he, I, he 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 feels like he's from a Pittsburgh. He lives in a Pittsburgh area to me. He's feeling like that that kind of uh, uh, steel coal mine industrial kind of town, and uh, so he he's uh, but he's gone. He's gone to California at this point. And he lives in California, and, and the first song is called Peace on Earth, and it sets up his situation. Second song tells you about that he's a bit of an outlaw. And then he starts getting thrown into these situations and scenarios, which is totally just not what he's used to. And it's always the same. It's a different woman, but the same face and the same name. And eventually he figures out that that he was that he could, that everything is okay in his life and that he can be what, I mean, it's kind of a marine slogan now I'm using. He can be what he wants to be, but he, there's, the future is, is okay. And he does, he does have a flashback and, and he, and he remembers going to see Elvis when he was 15. And then, then in the short story, they bring him back to life and he finds the nurse and her name is, who he thinks is Jenny, but her real name is Julia. And we kind of leave it there as a real inspirational um, ending that basically, yeah, I'm having a tough time now, but uh, you know what? When I get through this, it, all doors are open for me. Listening to the album, it sounds very vital. I, I know this was sort of a different record for you, but how was it different for you doing this record and working with Rob Cavallo? Well, it, you know what? Rob brings the best out of everybody. And he makes you better than you are, and it's just a confidence builder. And and you can you can get a sense from listening to this record how much fun and how much enjoyment and what kind of enthusiasm has been put in into this record from not just from me but everybody that worked on it. And it was really like uh, like an old uh, it was done almost like an old studio system movie where. We had a collection of musicians and writers all at the same time in one place. And uh, we were working on this story. The difference is the writers didn't know we were working on this story um, because I didn't tell them. Because I didn't want them to get too literal. I didn't, I, because it was real easy for writers to get too literal. And I wanted it to be uh, more of a dream like in a, in a fantasy situation as opposed to literal. And but the enthusiasm that Rob Cavallo brings to uh, a recording session is remarkable, and he just brings out the best in in every singer and every player. I mean, he made Steve Vai a better player, and Steve Vai is one of the great guitar players of all time. And he played a solo on "Song of Madness" that is one of the best guitar solos I've ever heard in my life. And 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 the vocals on this record, uh, I. I started to feel like I was uh, I was 24 again, and people were saying to me when I would do them, they say, "You sound like you did on bat." And I go, "No, I don't." And they go, "Yes, you do. Come in here and listen to this." And uh, it, I mean, he brought the youth out in me, and uh, too bad I can't hang on to it like Peter Pan, but that's the way it goes. Well, you can really hear it on the album, and and you had a lot of special guests on the album. That we'll talk about it in just a second. 